Well, hello and welcome to another Microsoft Reactor live event. Um, my name's Andrew Harvey, uh, and I want to welcome you. We can't uh, see you in person in our in our reactors right now because of the ongoing situation, uh, but we can uh, invite ourselves into your homes and we can beam ourselves into your homes. And so this is our opportunity to do that. Um, my name is Andrew Harvey. As I said, I'm the CTO in residence for Microsoft for Startups. Uh, I'm based in Sydney, but I also want to welcome a lot of our international viewers as well. I know we've connected through some of the uh, through our reactors in uh, San Francisco and Redmond, and I want to welcome all of you who have uh, joined in, have signed in uh, for this event. And I want to talk to you about something that um, is really dear to my heart, um, and it's about innovation, but it's also about people, because uh, I think sometimes we can forget in the midst of all of this. And, and trying to be productive at, at, the, at the heart of all that we're doing, people are key. And so I want to kick off uh, and talk a little bit about innovation. And uh, innovation is, it's, it's easy to get excited about. It's one of those, those buzzwords which is really easy to say. It has a sense of forward motion, it evokes, I don't know, stock images of a, of a group of people, say, pointing at a screen excitedly, or it's, it's AI and it's blockchain or it's drones and robots. But the question is, is it really? I would suggest that innovation is really a creative pursuit. It's, it's pushing out into the unknown waters and it's seeing what's there. And it's really more than just coming up with an idea. Real innovation is much more than that. It's crafting that idea and honing it into a product or a service that people are actually willing to exchange money for. And that's where our teams come in. See, building an innovative product or service is not an individual pursuit. It requires a team of people. And you want those people to be able to bring their whole selves to the problem and to contribute fully to the process of bringing this thing, whatever this thing is, to life. But so often what happens is, is we don't set things up that way. We don't set ourselves up to succeed. And so some people have looked into that, and I want to talk a little bit about Google, because in 2012, a group of people within Google set out trying to work out what it was that made teams within their company successful. And, and yes, it's that Google, a company that for us is, is synonymous with innovation over the last two decades. They didn't have a clear understanding in 2012 of what separated their high performing teams to those that were struggling. And so they, they, they put together a project team and they called this effort Project Aristotle. And you can look it up if you want. And so they looked at everything. They dug deep into academic literature and all the research that had gone before about what makes teams successful. And they looked at, was it having similar interests? Was it rewards and motivation? And then they took their, their microscopes and turned inwards and they looked at their teams and measured them in, in a, a way that only Google really, really would. And they, they measured all sorts of things like who had lunch with who and, and combinations of introversion and extroversion within teams. Oh, and my slides jump. And it turned out that there was a key discriminator. There was a key thing that unlocked potential within the teams. And this discriminator was the way that the team members interacted with one another. The teams created a place where teammates felt like that they were safe to speak up with ideas, with questions, with concerns. They even felt safe to, to speak up and admit their failures, their mistakes. So this idea is called psychological safety. And there's a researcher who, who kind of coined this term called Amy Edmondson, and she describes this set of conditions which where, where it's safe uh, inside these teams, a psychological safety. And, and when the team at Google came across this concept, it suddenly explained what they were seeing in their teams. It was the common thread between successful teams and those that were so that, that, that it was the common thread between successful teams that otherwise looked completely different in the way that they, they looked and the way that they worked. And so what was so special about these teams and, and this psychological safety. What was it that it unlocked? And, and, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. 
But first, we kind of need to dig into what psychological safety is and what it looks like. Because it turns out in our interactions, we're continuously doing this little bit of calculus in our heads. We're thinking, if I say this, am I going to face consequences? Now, those consequences may not be like the classic HR consequences. In fact, most of the time, if we're having that thought process, we probably shouldn't say the thing. But if I say this, am I going to be ridiculed? Am I going to be put down? Am I going to be rejected? Am I going to be dismissed? And it's not a conscious process necessarily, but it is continuously going on in the background of our heads. Let me demonstrate. We've all been in a meeting at some point in our careers. I'm sorry, I can't give you those hours back. What's done is done, but you've been in a meeting. And if you can think about the meetings that you've been in, have you ever found yourself in a meeting and found that you kept quiet when you've had an idea or a question because you were worried that you might look ignorant? Have you ever held back from presenting an idea because you had a fear that you might be seen as disruptive? Maybe you withheld a concern for fear that you'd be perceived as negative. Or you haven't spoken up about an error or a failure for fear of being seen as incompetent. See, this is it. This is the best way that I can demonstrate psychological safety or a lack of psychological safety in this case. Because psychological safety, as it's defined in the literature, is a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. It's a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Because it's a risk to ask a question. It's a risk to present an idea. It's a risk to raise a concern. And it's definitely a risk to admit a mistake or own up to a failure. And an environment where you believe it's safe to take those risks is one which is psychological safety psychologically safe. See, when you're innovating, when you're out in that unknown, when you're trying to build something new, silence can be deadly. And what we now know and understand as psychological safety more broadly across the workplace actually came from research that Amy Edmondson was doing when she was studying teams in hospitals. And her original thesis was that more effective uh, medical teams would have lower error rates. And it kind of seems logical, right? You, your more effective uh, teamwork would lead to greater cohesion and less mistakes. And so she surveyed a bunch of teams to measure their effectiveness as, as, as teams and compared that to their error rates. And what she saw was actually the exact opposite of her hypothesis. The high performing teams had much higher error rates. And so she did what good researchers do, and she went back and she sent in a research assistant who was completely blinded to the previous results. And she asked them to investigate all of these teams again through surveys and interviews and understand what made them tick. And what they found, and remember, they didn't know this at the time because they were blinded from the earlier results, was that the teams that were more effective and had higher error rates were actually more willing to talk about their errors. They were proactive in discovering errors and resolving them. And so they could move forward and actually provide a better standards of care. Because mistakes happen, people are fallible. And it's actually the silence about our mistakes. It's the silence about our questions that is dangerous. Think, for example, a nurse who notices a mistake on a chartered medication. They don't speak up for fear of being berated by a doctor. Or a first officer in the cockpit of a plane who doesn't ask their captain about a potential aircraft misconfiguration because they don't want to be belittled. That's where silence becomes very, in a very real sense, deadly. Now, we don't necessarily work in hospitals or aircraft cockpits, but silence can and will quash innovation. So your team, they need to be able to ask questions so that they, they have the context that they need to make the best decisions that they can and so that they can fully understand the problems that you're seeking to solve and the solutions you're seeking to build together. Your team need to be able to give voice to ideas no matter how left field they are because sometimes it's those left field ideas that lead to your solution. And 
even if they are not the solution themselves, they can take you in that direction. And it might be one in 10 or one in 100 that actually result in something, but sometimes you don't know which is going to be the idea that gets you there. So you have to be able to voice the 10 or the 100 to reach the one. Your team needs to be able to raise concerns about what you're doing. Sometimes those concerns can just be a result of incomplete information. And what that tells you is that you need to provide more context to your team. And sometimes those concerns can be because you've got different understandings of the same problem, and that's something that needs to be resolved. And sometimes it can be because there's something that up until now has been missed. And if you don't address it, it could sink the whole endeavor. Finally, your team needs to be able to feel safe to own up to their mistakes, to admit their failures, because catching things early and resolving them early is so much better than finding out down the line when a small problem has ballooned into a massive catastrophe. Mistakes and failures can still have consequences, but the aim can and should be to learn and to move forwards from failure. If we want to foster innovation, if we want to be you know, innovative startups or innovative enterprises or innovative in any part of our lives, we need to make it safe to speak up. I think it's important, so I'm going to say it again. If we want innovation, if we want to be innovative in startups, in established businesses, in massive enterprises, we need to make it safe to speak up. Now we're talking about innovation. If we're talking about innovation, we're talking about creating something from nothing or nearly nothing. And I like to think of innovation as this nexus of creativity and persistence. We need creativity to imagine things that don't exist. Solutions to problems, novel processes, uh, all sorts of things to radically increase efficiency. And the process of creating something from nothing inherently involves risk. And we kind of understand that at an organizational level. And, and that's kind of been well understood and we have ways of mitigating that, like lean startup and all sorts of processes like that. Inside that process, however, there's all sorts of risks that's required at an interpersonal level. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about psychological safety. Because that risk manifest in us as individuals is fear. It, um, it looks interesting there in, in big bold type doesn't really uh, engender me with a lot of confidence, doesn't make me feel like innovating. But fear in this interpersonal context is anticipated shame. Why do we fear asking a question? It's because we fear being branded as ignorant, and that's anticipated shame. We're feeling that shame of being branded as ignorant in advance before we even ask the question, and that can stop us from asking the question. Why do we fear putting an idea out there, presenting it to the world? It, it might get shouted down, or we get called disruptive or a time waster. Or worse, the team agrees to do it, and it ends up failing, and we get labeled as a failure. And that's more anticipated shame. How many of you heard, have heard this, this adage, this phrase, fear is the mind killer? Now, it comes from Frank Herbert's book, June, and the, the more full version of that is fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. And it, it's kind of entered our psyche, this collective consciousness as a, as a truism, and, and it's actually true in a biological sense. Fear and shame kind of live in our limbic system. It's the powerful center of our brain. It's, it's a powerful center of our brain. We kind of call it the lizard brain. And what happens when fear and shame take over is they rob the rest of our brain uh, from energy, from cognitive resources. And so what happens is we end up concentrating on the fear and our, and our response to that fear and avoiding that thing that we fear and not in those higher order cognitive functions that we really need to be engaged in if we're innovating. It's an automatic response, and it, and it robs us of the cognitive horsepower that we need to be creative. And innovation is all about creativity and persistence. Many years ago, I was working at a startup. Uh, we built a product that would do app search and recommendations, and my job was to process the data from various app stores and organize it and, and, and clean it so that the algorithms that the various PhDs on our team had designed 
could be run across it and the right recommendations could be made and the search engine could find the right apps. And so I had been given this task of improving the way we kept track of apps. We had been given access uh, to this file, this magical data file that had all of the data of all of the apps in the App Store and all of their details. And so I was responsible for building a process that would each day munge that file uh, when we received it so that it could be used by our algorithms. And I embarked across, uh, upon this task with gusto. I felt like I had everything I needed to do it, and I, I confidently approached uh, working on it. But after a few weeks, I actually really began to struggle with this. I couldn't get the data to line up. I couldn't get it to do what I wanted to do, and, and I felt useless. I felt daunted, and I, it was part of it was because I was in this team of PhDs. And here was I, I had dropped out of, out of university after one semester, and I couldn't admit defeat because that would confirm what everyone was thinking about me or what I thought everyone was thinking about me, that I wasn't smart enough for this job. And so one day my boss, who herself was a PhD, uh, called me up for an update on the project and I, I just couldn't hide my lack of progress any longer. Um, and so I told her that I couldn't make the data work and I, I wasn't sure why. It was in theory perfect. It was in theory exactly what we needed but it didn't seem to work and I was I was really flustered. I was anxious and I was sure that my boss was gonna fire me on the spot and I'd wasted so much time. And, and if you've worked in a startup, you know that time is a precious resource. You only have so much uh, time and runway to work with. And so I had this conversation with my boss, but she didn't fire me. You know what she did? She said, Andrew, you're obviously very stressed out by this. You're obviously trying your hardest and I trust you. And I trust that there is something weird with this data. I, what I want you to do, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take the rest of the day off and come back tomorrow so we can look at strategies. And I, I breathed a sigh of relief. I took the rest of that day off and I decompressed. And, I, and the next day I came back in and I was ready to look for new strategies. With an open mind, I started looking through all sorts of weird and wonderful documentation, and I found an article about a search API that would give us all the information that we needed from this data file and more, and it turned out that it worked. I got curious. I poked at it and I found that it could do exactly what we wanted. And this is not something that wasn't there the week before. It's something I should have done a week before, but my fear of looking bad in front of my colleagues meant that my limbic system had taken over. I wasn't able to see clearly. I wasn't able to get creative with the strategies to move forwards. My cognitive resources had been robbed by that fight or flight instinct. And so what happened was I got consumed by <coughs> hiding my lack of pro progress for another day and another day and another day while I futilely built my, be, beat my head against this problem, when if I had been able to step back away from that fear and be creative, as I was after talking to my boss, I could have moved forward much quicker. In the end, fear is a waste of precious cognitive resources. If we can create environments where people feel safe taking interpersonal risks, if we can create environments where people feel safe to be vulnerable, and exposed that they, might, that they might not know everything, that they might be stuck, that they might have this gnawing concern at the back of their brains that they can't get rid of. If we do that, we allow space for people to use their cognitive resources for creativity and productivity rather than being sucked into their limbic systems and focusing on fear and shame. And so at this point, sometimes people will ask, isn't fear a powerful motivator? And the answer to that is, well, it is and it isn't. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're in the industrial age or the pre-industrial age where you need people to shovel coal into furnaces faster, or you need to move heavy boxes of widgets from A to B, then fear is probably an effective tool. The thing is, that's not what we're trying to do. We want people to be curious. We want them to be creative, to be open-minded and to explore. And the problem is that fear shuts down these processes. We can't deal with every fear that someone might come to work with. 
But what we can do is we, cre we can create spaces where the anticipated shame involved in interpersonal risk is reduced. So what we have is we have happier, more collaborative and more creative teams. And that's exactly what we need for innovation. Did you know that our teams actually have a collective IQ? The whole of the team is greater than the sum of the parts, but we only get this, we only unlock this uh, collective IQ when we have psychological safety within our groups. Because fear not only kills our individual intelligence creativity, but it also kills our groups collective intelligence and creativity. So there were some researchers out of Carnegie Mellon that conducted a study in 2010 which investigated this idea of collective intelligence and what they found was a group's collective intelligence and success across a range of tasks wasn't determined by either the average individual intelligence or the maximum intelligence or the minimum intelligence of any individual in the group. It was mediated by the behaviours aligned with psychological safety. Now there's been a lot more research that has been done around psychological safety and in since Amy Edmondson's work and what's been found is that it's a mediating factor. What that means is that it unlocks the effects of other positive factors. So there's been studies that show that the collective IQ of more diverse teams, that is teams coming from different backgrounds, having different experiences, representative of different communities, is higher than teams that are homogeneous. And so psychological safety becomes a critical factor in these teams. But it, it kind of, the, the stakes are higher as well because people who are from underrepresented backgrounds generally are going to have a background of, at a base level of, uh, of unsafety, as it were, because of the discrimination that, that they, they so often experience. And so having a diverse team means that there is incredible potential, but it, it ratchets up the need to focus on psychological safety within those groups. It's easier for us to feel safe around people who look like us and, and have shared our experiences, but you get a greater payoff if you can establish psychological safety in a more diverse group. So what do we do? How do we create spaces where it's safe to take these interpersonal risks? The first thing to do is to help manage the larger landscape which you find yourself in. And I don't mean uh, putting some plants in the office, uh, but what I actually mean is the landscape of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, these are some words that came through research in the US military um, to define the landscape which troops often find themselves in in the battlefield. And when we're innovating, we're not in the battlefield, but we're dealing with a lot of these things. To build an environment of psychological safety, we need to create a space which provides guardrails inside this volatile landscape, inside this VUCA landscape. We need to create a shared understanding of where we're going even if we're not quite sure how we're going to get there. So goal certainty is one of the, the, the factors which builds a long-term psychological safety, and that was found in a 2005 study. It's also been shown as a significant part of Google's research as part of Project Aristotle. Knowing what you're working towards provides a scope. It provides a kind of box in which the questions, the ideas and the concerns can sit inside and it provides some bounds and it provides a degree of understanding that you're all heading in the same direction. Having a clear articulation of goals reduces unnecessary interpersonal conflict from people who might be working on the same task but actually trying to solve different problems. And so we come to mindset. In the 1980s, a researcher called Carol Dweck published a paper which would soon form what we now understand as growth mindset. And it characterizes two mindsets, one which sees someone's abilities, their intelligence and talent as fixed traits, and the other which understands them as things that can be developed through teaching and through commitment. And the research originally came from educational research, how we teach our children for the best outcomes, but it's now come to change the way that we think about workplaces as well. 
A fixed mindset, when we think about it in this context, is uh, someone with a fixed mindset is marked by a desire to look smart. And they tend to avoid challenges that they don't feel like they can innately overcome. And if they do encounter a challenge or an obstacle, they'll tend to give in more easily or become defensive about it. They will frequently compare themselves with others and they, they tend to respond quite negatively to criticism. By contrast, someone with a growth mindset is marked by a desire to learn and improve. Challenges are embraced as opportunities and, and obstacles are met with renewed effort and new strategies. They, someone with a growth mindset finds inspiration and they seek to learn from others and they see criticism as an opportunity for improvement. The thing is, often when we're trying to innovate, we can slip into this fixed mindset quite easily or feed into other people's fixed mindsets. When we're working in software development, especially I come from a software development background, I especially see this. What we can risk doing is valuing people exclusively for their abilities and their intelligence. And that can lead into a common trope that you might have seen, which is this mythical idea of the 10x engineer, an engineer that gets 10 times done more than a regular developer, whatever a regular developer is. And the problem is 10x engineers, sometimes they're called rock stars or ninjas or gurus, they can tend to derive their identity from their ability. And that can affect the way that they interact. It can affect their interpersonal uh, communication and it can affect your whole team's dynamics. Remember that a fixed mindset drives a need to be seen as smart. So your 10x engineer is often gonna have this need. And so when someone else has an idea, they might dismiss it or belittle it out of hand. They are not gonna ask as many questions because it risks them being seen as ignorant. And that rubs off on your team. Remember, psychological safety unlocks the collective IQ of your team. And so you could have one incredibly smart team member, but if their behavior is reducing the psychological safety of your team, you won't be getting the best out of your team. You're actually limiting that collective IQ. So you need to coach this individual towards a growth mindset, or you need to consider whether they're actually a fit for your team at all. And that's a whole process. And I wanna concentrate on you and your team. What you need to do is you need to focus your team on learning. Because in the context of learning, questions become opportunities for the team to learn together. Learning what hasn't been fully communicated. And, and ideas become ways for exploring the constraints and the possibilities which you're working with. Learning refocuses us on growth. As individuals and as a group, we should be constantly growing and adapting from what we learn. And the most impor important effect of focusing on learning and growth is that, that it reframes failure. Failures suddenly become learning opportunities. And so what you end up doing is you, you get curious. The key here is to get curious rather than casting blame. And it doesn't matter whether you're a leader or an individual contributor. The key here is to get curious instead of casting blame. Because what happens with blame is blame undermines any sense of psychological safety within a group. But what curiosity does is it helps us understand the system together. It, understand, it helps us understand what's going on together. And while we're dealing with individuals in terms of sometimes these, these failures and mistakes, we innovate as a team and we succeed or fail as a team. And so when an initiative fails, it can be easy for us to want to pin blame on someone. But what's more useful is actually to get curious together. What context did we have? What would we do differently next time? How can we foresee things like this? How are we going to get better next time? The next thing that we need to do in terms of fostering this growth mindset is to foster persistence. Remember how I said previously that innovation is a combination of creativity and persistence? And that's actually what a growth mindset builds in, in us as individuals. However, what we need to do is we need to build an environment for that to happen. We need a team and a company that provides psychological safety so that people feel safe to learn, to ask questions, to get curious. 
in the end, a lot of this is going to depend on leadership. And not all of us are in leadership positions, but we can affect uh, some level of leadership within a team, no matter what our rank or station is. How much context are we giving to provide clarity of our goals and, and of other people's goals? As a leader, if you're a leader, how much context are you giving to provide the clarity of goals and the constraints within your teams? When something goes wrong, are leaders looking to blame someone or do they get curious? Are the leaders looking to grow their team members or are they emphasizing uh, and, and, and are they emphasizing team growth as a priority? These are the things that set up teams to be psychologically safe. This is what sets up teams to be places where innovation can actually really happen. And we don't always get it right. Uh, I, I once had a, a team member um, come up to me and ask me, did you know that the way that you respond to this other team member is making them feel unsafe? Like they're always getting shut down and now they don't want to contribute to discussions. And despite my best intentions, what had happened is I had created a psychologically safe environment as a leader. And that was really hard uh, to realize. And so I set out to, to work to repair the damage um, in this team and try and repair this relationship. And, and in the end, the only thing that really repaired that relationship and got us moving forwards was the news that I was moving on to a new role. And that really hurt. So I've learned some of these lessons the hard way, and there's a few things that are going to help us unlock this, both as leaders and as, as members of a team. It all comes down to one overarching idea. And it's especially important for leaders. It's about modeling vulnerability. In the end, a psychologically safe place is where someone can bring their whole selves. They can bring their ideas, their questions, their concerns, and yes, their failures. And they can have all of this, and they can have all of these things on the table because there's a shared understanding that we are all growing as individuals and as a team. Now, after her tremendously successful uh, TEDx Austin talk on vulnerability, researcher Brene Brown was flooded with inquiries from, from corporates and tech companies wanting her to speak to their teams. And Brene, um, in her second TED talk, talks about, uh, that she tells a story where they would come to her and they would ask, we love what you have to say, but could you just lay off the vulnerability and shame stuff? Because that was really what she talked about a lot. But we're not, because we're not comfortable with these ideas. We're not comfortable with shining a light on. And I think that's especially true um, speaking as a man, as as men. And I think that's some work uh, that, that men need to do, especially in terms of vulnerability. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the key researchers on these three very important areas are women. But back to Brene Brown, her response to this question, can you just tone down the vulnerability and shame stuff? You don't, can you not talk about that? When she was asked by tech companies to do that, she, she said, OK, what, what would you like instead? And their response generally was some combination of innovation, creativity and change. Sounds pretty good. And her response was this. Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity and change. So if you want to do some work on this yourself, I highly recommend checking out Brene Brown's TED Talks. She's got a Netflix special. You know something's going right if, if you've got a Netflix special and your area of focus is on vulnerability. Um, so it's really worth checking out some of Brene's work. She also has uh, some great books. Uh, Dare to Lead is one that I would particularly recommend. But if we're modeling vulnerability, building a psychologically safe teams, it can very rarely happen from the bottom up. It will definitely not happen by accident. What it requires is intentional choices by leaders. And that means modeling the behaviors that we want to see. And let me introduce you uh, to two phrases which are immensely powerful when, leader, when wielded by leaders, but also by members of the team. And they're especially powerful in places like startups and other places where innovation happens. And these phrases 
despite their power, are, are tremendously underutilized. Are you ready? The first of them, I don't know. Too often, if we're leading startups or teams who are innovating, what we get caught up on is needing to know the answers. So we fill empty spaces with our best guesses or, or we waffle along or we run away from questions that we can't answer. So we need to come back to say, I don't know. Even better, we can, we can lean in and we can follow up with, what do you think we should do? Or what's your gut telling you? Even better, how do we find out? And what we do in doing that is we empower our teams to ask more questions and learn together and to, and to use that shared intelligence, that collective intelligence more effectively. The second phrase that I want anyone who is a leader in the room, well, or in whatever room you are in, um, or who has aspirations to be a leader, and it's probably the harder phrase of the two, and it really brings the vulnerability, but correctly deployed, it's gonna help you open up your team as a safe space to try things and to innovate. I messed up. You might choose more colorful language, but you get the idea. We have to own our mistakes. As leaders, we desperately want to be infallible. We want to be right all the time. And we wonder if admitting a mistake is going to undermine our authority somehow with our team. But let me tell you this. This is the dirty little secret. Your team already knows you messed up. Your authority is best earned by owning your fallibility and inviting your team to be part of the growth journey from there. Remember, failures are inevitable. We take risks and we make calls and sometimes we make the wrong ones. I, I know many leaders who give their teams more grace than they give themselves. And that seems like a good thing on one level, but holding yourself to a higher standard without uh, a can sometimes, without opening that up to growth, can sometimes create a very unhealthy environment. And so I want to wrap up here and, and we're going to get to some questions, but I just want to remind you, psychological safety is about being able to speak up in a team because silence is deadly. Silence is going to quash innovation in your team. If people can't speak up with their questions, with their ideas, their concerns and their failures, innovation will be quashed. Because this, this fear, this anticipated shame that's, that's created by this unwillingness to create, take those interpersonal risks is going to kill creativity within your team. And if you do step into creating a psychologically safe team, what you do is you unlock diversity. You unlock the collective intelligence of your team. And so what we need to do is we need to create shared goals. We need to always be growing and we need to model vulnerability. Having a psychologically safe environment is not going to guarantee that your business is going to be a breakout, breakout success overnight. Ideas aren't necessarily going to fall from the sky, but if you do have a nugget of gold in there, then my suggestion is that the best way that you can make sure that you have the innovation and the creativity and the change that you want is to have your team bring their whole selves to work, to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to put their hand up when they don't understand, to give voice to their left field ideas, to talk about their concerns and to admit their failures. Psychological safety is, is developed in a whole team. While it predominantly is fostered from the top down, it can come from the bottom up as well. And the way that we interact with the different people in our team is part of that environment. So I wanna share with you some, some resources before we get to questions. We're going to have a little bit of a chat about some of the other events that are going on through our Reactor Live events. But this here, this link here, you can scan the QR code or you can have a look at the, uh, the, the link, has a whole bunch of resources. It has all of the papers that I've referenced in the talk. It has uh, some books, some videos, some various things that you might be interested if you want to dig into this. And so I'm going to um, ask Nadia to jump in and tell us a little bit about uh, what's coming up with our Reactor Live events. And I'm going to have a look at some of your questions. Um, please do uh, contribute any questions that you'd like. And um, we've got a little bit of time to get into them. But for now, Nadia. 
Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, so I'm just going to take everyone through the Reactor live stream events that we do have up and coming. So next week we've got a session on overview of Django, uh, one of the most popular web development frameworks. This session here is going to cover basics of Django, how to get installed and set up. That is then followed by a session on social entrepreneurship. So this session is going to be led by Annie Parker, who was part of our Microsoft for Startups team. Uh, she leads the community engagement. Annie will be joined by Shalu, who's the Managing Director for Silicon Valley and Southwest Regions for Startups. So they're going to share their personal experiences with tech for good startups and advice they have for social enterprise founders. We are then followed by another session, which is broken up into two parts. Um, sorry, that is an incorrect title. <laughs> this one should be Angular for Beginners, part one. Um, if you're a solid beginner or intermediate level um, who wants to upskill with Angular, this would be a good session to tune into. Um, so again, if you want to follow and see what events we do have on at the Reactor, feel free to join our meetup page, which is Microsoft Reactor Sydney. You'll also be able to find uh, more information on our Twitter as well. Um, and on this page, you'll be able to see not just our events, but a lot of the global events we have up and coming. Um, so I'm going to flick this one back to Andrew now, who will be able to go through the Q&A. So Andrew, over to you. Great. We've got some really fantastic questions. Um, well, we've got one really fantastic question. If there are any more, please feel free to contribute them. Uh, but this question is, in today's forced distributed team model. Uh, a lot of people are talking about anxiety rather than fear. Do you have any comments or advice uh, on anxiety instead of fear? How do we foster psychologically safe? Uh, I'm going to start with that and then I'm going to deal with the second part of the question because it's a long question. Um, anxiety and fear really come from the same place in terms of, again, neurologically, it's, it's all out of um, that fight or flight reflex and anxiety tends to be this long, uh, this heightened uh, sense of awareness and this heightened fight or flight um, response. And so what can happen if, is if you already have a baseline of anxiety is that that can ramp up the effects of the, that fear, anticip anticipated shame, because you're already kind of in that space, in that cognitive space. Um, so this is going to mean that psychological safety and being able to have an environment which is safe to take those risks where you, you reduce that fear is super important. And, and so really for us, um, there are some things that we can't control. Uh, and, and we I guess we need to acknowledge that as team members, as leaders, we can't um, we can't change the nature of the crisis that we are in. Uh, but there are some things that we can change and we can change how we interact as a team. We can be more supportive, more empathetic. We can listen better. We can we can do all of these things to make people feel heard and feel safe in that context. And that is going to help us um, compensate for the, the baseline of anxiety uh, that, that, that is, is just there. Uh, I think one of the things that, that we can do, especially is within this environment, because it is a new environment and everyone's working themselves out and, and how this all hangs together. And so allowing, setting that up as a growing experience rather than saying we have to get it right from day one is to actually grow together. And there's an opportunity in that. Um, it's gonna, you're going to allow people to uh, to try things, to get it wrong, uh, and it's really important to be able to, to make that a growing experience rather than having any um, repercussions for getting it wrong, but to, to really push along that, that growth trajectory. Now, the second part of that question um, was, uh, how do we foster psychologically safety, psychological safety in teams that are not super connected day to day because they're remote? And I think that is um, it comes a lot down to to the mediums um, that we're we're communicating over. Now, if you're used to being in the same room as someone, you're used to a particular level of um, I describe it as bandwidth, a, a particular amount of um, communication coming at you. And and what's happened is we've been split up. Is that that the amount uh, of communication and the frequency of that communication has reduced. And so what happens is our brain starts to fill in the gaps. And that can be a bad thing uh, because our brains, uh, if, if we don't feel safe, if we feel like other people's default assumption of, of us is negative, um, then what happens is we fill in a negative picture. And, and that can often happen as we reduce that frequency of, of communication. So silence is replaced by negativity. And so 
what it means is that we need to be conscious of over communicating and that we probably need to over index on uh, praise. We need to over index on uh, positive communication and maybe consider how we do that, that critique a little differently. Uh, and so that that's how I would approach that. I have another question here. Um, how do we bring in remote teams people who are naturally more introverted and not actively participating in, in team discussions? Should we incentivize or KPI team contributions to be fair across the board? This is a really interesting one. Um, part of the research that Google did actually found that conversational turn taking was a really important part of psychological safety and, and, and uh, evidence of psychological safety in the team. That doesn't necessarily mean that everyone talks an equal amount um, in, in, a, in a given meeting, but it does mean that across, you know, aggregated across a period of time, everyone has a chance to speak up. And I, I, what I've found as a leader is trying to poke people until they talk is not necessarily an effective way of doing things. I think more often it's about coming alongside and encouraging people to speak up. If, if you have a more introverted or a less confident team member, um, even if you're not leading the group, coming alongside them, hearing their ideas and validating their ideas in a one-to-one -one context can give them more confidence to bring those into the group context. And then also when they do bring their ideas, listen to the response that the team has. And if someone shuts them down or someone repeats their idea and claims it as their own, then it's really important to advocate and be an ally to that person and to, to make sure that their voice is, is validated in that context. Because often what can happen is they can get quashed by the more confident voices in the room. Um, and, and so there's, it's important as we as those voices, as you want those voices to be heard and as they do speak up, to really reinforce that and to be positive about that. Again, be liberal with your praise and be um, and, and very public with your praise and maybe more private with your critique. Uh, the question is, uh, will the webinar be recorded uh, and it should be available on demand? Nadia has already answered that. Um, Now that you're more experienced as a team, um, uh, team uh, now that you're more experienced, how would you handle it if you don't motivate team members to speak up as a team leader? Do you still think that sometimes the answer is to change the team leader? I think sometimes it does. Um, I think it is uh, important to um, to look at team dynamics and look at who works well with who. And if there is some, if you are able to shuffle things and people put people in environments where they can. Um, relearn or, or unlearn some some um, feelings of, of the, unlearn the uh, the shrinking away, then that's a positive thing. And they, then that that transition may be to happen. But it really a mileage may vary. Like it depends drastically on what's going on in your teams and, and who you have available and who's who fits where. So I'd be cautious about doing too much shuffling. I think really having some hard conversations, modeling vulnerability, it takes time. And part of what happened for me was there just wasn't enough time. Like it takes six to 12 months to do some of this repair work if you've really dug yourself in a hole like I did. Um, and then with a final question, there was a question about speaking of allyship, um, does it take the risk of taking credit for someone else's contributions? And my suggestion with allyship is you should never, you should always get the other person to talk, uh, speak up um, where possible and to, to reinforce them and always redirect and name drop that person. Name drop the heck out of it and, and be really positive towards them um, and, and make sure that there is no impression that it's your contribution, but it's this other person um, that has done this good work. What I'm suggesting is that you have a one-to-one -one conversation with someone who has um, a particular level of expertise, but maybe doesn't speak up. And so you have that one-to-one -one conversation, say, hey, that's a really good idea. You should tell the team. And when they tell the team, that's when you back them up, say that's re reinforce what you said, that, that is a great idea. And if someone comes across them, be ready to run interference and to, to, to support this person because they you don't want to reinforce their impression that this is an unsafe place to do that. And that may mean um, taking the other parts of the other team members who might have talked across them aside, again, in private and saying, hey, did you know what you did had a negative effect on this other person and thus our team? And, and that feeling safe within our team is really important. So I think that's, that would be my approach to that. 
Um, we are at time, so uh, I'm going to wrap up by saying thank you very much. Once again, um, there is a link here and there is the QR code uh, that you can check out. Um, we're going to linger for a little bit longer, um, but we want to thank you. Hope to see you at our, one of our, our later events that Nadia has talked about. Um, but for me, have a good morning, evening, wherever you are.